Good morning, CCSM. Thank you. Uh, I think wearing this choir gown and joining this fabulously welcoming choir is already a resurrection to me after 10 years of dormancy. Whoa. I believed many of us had experienced at one point in our lives struggling to live while dying for a moment at the same time. Growing up in the Philippines, I visualized myself, be myself becoming a pastor someday. That childhood desire was shattered right away when my family and friends discouraged me for the reason that female pastors will never get an equal treatment and support from the church. With broken heart, I convinced myself to pursue architecture, which is my second choice. And I was in my second year in architecture when my father died. My family can't afford to continue sending me to school. I was lost. The cultural and social values of my fam oh, and my family's economic condition became the controlling forces that I could not be who I want to be. So between working and studying, my life continues. Seeking for what I really want to pursue in life, I realized I was meant to be a teacher, and I am fulfilled. Migrating to another country was never part of my plan and never become a dream until I decided to come over and visit a loved one who is in a despair situation. During my stay, a charter school opened a teaching opportunity. I was sponsored for work authorization and a permanent residency. It seems like things went so easy. Overwhelmed with the idea of reuniting with a loved one here in California, I did not realize that I will face, or what will I face as an immigrant. I battled with homesickness, culture shock, and feeling of being a total stranger. Worst, my eldest brother and my mother died a year apart, but I was not able to come home to see them for the last time. If I leave this country, the possibility of re-entering will be very slim. My application for residency that time was still in process. I was in my ter third month mourning for my mother's death when I received the news that the school is closing. Oh. The fear of becoming out of status devastated me. I felt dying inside. I started to doubt. I asked God if he sees me. I felt it was a dark moment. Family and friends prayed for me, and in a span of a week, God sent me to a Christian school who is very much willing to continue the sponsorship. After nine years, I became a permanent resident and was able to finally visit my mother, now in the grave in the Philippines. I survived in some aspect of life as an immigrant because the Christian school I was serving became my extended family, and I received so much love and support from them. I'm grateful for everything. Things went well. But workload made me a plain church attendee. I just come and go. No home church for almost 10 years. There are also times in school I have to mute myself while the deepest part of my humanity is screaming because my personal conviction and my social, moral, and spiritual values are quite different from the school's policy, values, and principle. So with heavy heart, after 13 years, I resigned and accepted an offer to manage homes for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As I continue my journey, my heart and soul longs for a church, for a community that genuinely assures you that whoever you are, you all know this, wherever you are in life's journey, you are most welcome. So God led me to a church and a community I am longing for. Where else? Here, CCSM. 
The guiding principles of the church and weekly sermons liberate me from guilt, from the feeling of in imprisonment to what is morally right and acceptable to people around me, and from the controlling forces that hinder me to see God's plan in my life. So the dying moment is over. This community freed me and many of us from the images our society imposed us. This community feels and sees me in every phase of my journey. Reverend Penny assures me that no matter who I am, I am God's beloved and in me, God is well pleased. When Rev. Penny, Rev. Jorge, Ann Lee, Marge, and Mama Miriam joined me as, as I stand in this holy ground during my union with the loved one, I, with the one I dearly love, I felt God's unconditional love. That very moment, I experienced resurrection. My chains are gone. In my life's journey, I encounter God. In every situation, God extends his grace and mercy. And I realized my creator allowed me to go through all those experiences of struggling to live and die for a moment so I could be recreated. I am Chona Tendero, and it is a blessing to share with you my resurrection story. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Bob Duffy. A number of you uh, probably recognize me and know my story already. For those of you who don't, I'm the uh, guy that sits in the back there looking like he's about to rob the place um, <laughs> and afraid to touch anything. Uh, the reason for that is that uh, six months ago, I was uh, lucky enough to get a lung transplant, double lung transplant. Um, unlucky enough to need it, lucky enough to get it. Um, and so that's my personal, almost literal, uh, resurrection story that I'd like to share with you all. Um, when I was talking with my teenage son, who also happens to be named Thomas, um, and I told him that Penny had asked me to say a few words about my personal resurrection, his comment to me was, but you didn't die, you weren't dead, and you weren't resurrected. And I said, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, technically I wasn't dead. I was getting close, um, a lot closer than I thought, actually, when they opened me up and took a look inside. So, um, so it was close, but I said, you know what? The thing is, somebody did have to die. Somebody did die, and that was my, my donor, who I don't know yet. Uh, hopefully, I'll get to know this person, some, or who this person was someday. But um, I, I mentioned to him, I, I kind of put it in the analogy, because we're both baseball fans, that it's kind of like a, a combined no-hitter. You know, between the two of them, there was a death and there was a life because I got my life back thanks to the gift that this person gave me, that this person's family gave me. Um, not only that, in our experience, um, when I got the call and went to the hospital, uh, I had to wait a day, 24 hours, before they took me into surgery. And they told, it, they told us that the reason for the wait was that where the donor was, they had to wait for the team that was coming to get the heart. And they, so that meant that the family had to keep the, their loved one on life support for 24 hours until the surgical team could come and get the heart, and then they could get the lungs after that. And so that means that, that this family, whoever they were, uh, were potentially giving organs to up to four to five people. And so out of the tragedy that they experienced and the death of their loved ones, there could be as many as five, even maybe six people out there, like me, who got a new lease on life, literally. And um, so that's obviously when you think about it, or you know, physically it was quite an experience to go through, but uh, mentally, emotionally, uh, it's, uh, it really does a number on you to think about that. You know, to get a gift like that from somebody who doesn't even know you. I mean, it's totally selected at random. And, um, you, you go through a lot of thoughts, a lot of 
things go through your mind. How do you, how do you repay that gift? How do, you, how do you possibly live up to that? Um, there's no real easy answer to that other than I do feel a sense of responsibility, uh, you know, with this gift of, of life that I've been given back uh, to, to do something with it, not just to sit at home and watch baseball, but, you know, live my life. Um, but also, when you, when you really start to experience that, it's not uncommon to feel guilty, you know, to feel, wow, this person died, I got to live, you know. And I was also experiencing that even before the uh, surgery as I started to decline physically. There were fewer things I could do, um, fewer things I could do around the house. My, my lovely wife, Becky, picked up the slack for me. And, and I was telling my therapist one day, because you do need therapy to get through this, um, that I was feeling guilty about the fact that I wasn't able to help around the house anymore. People were having to wait on me, uh, my kids. And, and she said something to me that's always stuck. She said, well, instead of feeling guilty, why don't you feel grateful? And I thought to myself, and it was like, wow, that is such a much more pleasant emotion. And, you know, I mean, and it, it's positive, too. Uh, you know, because guilt is... You can't do anything with guilt, but gratitude you can do a lot with, and, and it's, 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 you know, invigorating. It, it, it's positive. It's, it's life-affirming. And so that's what I'm, hopefully, when I, if I can make contact with the, the donor family, which after six months I'm a, permitted to write a letter, and it has to be delivered anonymously, and then it's up to them if they want to get in touch with me or not. Uh, but I hope I can get in touch with them, because I've got this bond with this family now. Um, and I hope we can share that bond, you know, even with the rest of the life that I've been given back. Um, but also, I want to express to them the gratitude that I have. It's not like I have a debt that I owe them, but I just have to say thank you. And, um, you know, and, and so that, thinking about that, you know, getting my life back after having lost it, it makes me think about how easy it is or was to take life for granted. Because we all get it, we're all born, we all go through life, and um, it, you know, we, we like to say, oh, life's a gift, and this and that, and the other thing. Uh, but we don't always really feel it viscerally unless we go through an experience like I did. So um, if I can help remind everyone, you know, it is a gift, it's a wonderful gift, and uh, we should all be grateful. And I certainly know I am, so thank you. Good morning. When Penny asked me a few weeks ago um, if I was willing to share my story, I realized that I haven't done it, um, and this is the first time that I'm going to do it, and I'm really grateful that I get to do it in such a, a safe place for me to be. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was born and raised in the beautiful Costa Rica. I come from families that are strong, independent, smart, supportive, loving, and perfectly dysfunctional. I made one of the most significant decisions in my life when I was about eight years old. My parents were divorcing and I was asked to choose with whom I wanted to stay. Without hesitation, I decided to stay with my dad. By the time the divorce happened, we were at my grandparents' house. I lived with them until I moved to California. I had wonderful models. They were parents. They were friends. They were my supporters. With them, I learned that religion was different than a spirituality. The words without actions were only words. I learned that a chronic illness could be handled gracefully and should not stop you from reaching your potential. I learned that regardless of your age, you never stop evolving and learning. I learned that people deserve second chances. I learned that you care for, that, for others. I learned that we all have voices and ideas and beliefs. But above, above all, 
every single action they took, every single care, they reminded me that God is with us and that he guides us and he loves us. I moved to California years later to be with my mom, my step stepdad, and my sisters, which was not an easy transition for me. My upbringing, different upbringing, was getting pronounced more and more. I figured that if I follow the rules, like if I had break them by the early decision I made when I was eight, I was going to be normal. I listened to my parents, I obeyed them, I married, I waited to have a child. I was devoted to my husband, my family, I cared for others, I helped others, I was present for others, I worked, I went to church, I prayed, and I prayed. Little by little, others became my voice and ideas. I became them. Because of others and the demands I had, I became a planner. A very good one. I planned everything. I planned outings, meals, phone calls, visits, doctors, for everyone, for others. By Monday, I had planned the weekend. And everybody knew the plans. I told everyone what to do. I lived to plan. The more I lived this way, the less I became, until about six years ago. I was nearing 40 years old, and by nearing, I mean two years prior. I needed to be prepared and plan for the unexpected changes that were going to happen to me. I was at one of my annual checkups, and I asked the doctors, I'm almost 40. I need to plan what is coming. Can we talk about it? We talk and we planned. The start of the process was gonna start early. I was gonna be tested, but I'm so glad the doctor listened. I've always been healthy, so no concerns for me or my doctors. The three follow-up appointments became six, and the six became 10, and by the end of the summer of 2012, I was diagnosed with the early stage of one of the most aggressive breast cancer types. My life was taking an unplanned and unexpected turn. This is when my story of death and resurrection starts. The first day after final diagnosis were very significant for me. I felt like I was dying. I didn't know if I was dying. I know we were all gonna die. I knew it was gonna die. But when death becomes real and became real for me, my life just went through my eyes and I knew that wasn't the life I meant to be, the, the, the life I meant to live. The emotional pain that I felt, I didn't know I could. I felt I was dying when I called my parents to share the news. How ironic that their easy child, the one that followed the rules, the one who never gave them problems was causing them so much pain and left them helpless. The most difficult conversation that I had during that time was, was when I told, my, I told my eight-year-old what was happening. Talk about emotional death. How do you tell your eight-year-old that she could potentially be motherless? I was terrified, I was broken, I felt alone. This was not part of my plan. One morning after my family left to work and school, I cried in ways that I didn't know a human body could. I could not stop. Um, I do remember saying and having the energy to be able to voice, God, I'm here. Please help me. God, I'm here. Please help me. I'm not quite sure how much time or how many times I said it, but I do remember the stillness, the quiet, the peace I began to feel. I knew with all my being that at that particular moment, God was there for me. 
In that moment, cancer became something that I had to do. I made a few decisions, I made a few decisions, but one of those, two of those decisions where I was gonna experience this as strong as gracefully as I could, and I was gonna turn this horrible experience and diagnosis into something positive for me. I know that God did not give me cancer, but without a single doubt, I know that he was in control. Everything changed. My family dynamic had to change. I went from doing everything to breathing. My plan was not to plan. My sisters, my dear friend, became my unconditional physical and emotional support. I was embraced by my parents' prayers and family and friends that were there when I needed them. Yaeli was cared for by her dad. I had to learn to allow myself to care for others. I learned to live day by day. I learned to love the simple pleasures of life, rain, fog, colors, sleep, chicken soup and ice cream. I learned to stop judging myself. I stopped trying to fit in the normal. I stopped apologizing to others for the decisions I made. I saw another reflection of me when I lost my hair, when my nails were falling, and when I lost the sense of smell and taste. In those moments of solitude, which I've learned to love, it was the first time that I got to hear my voice in years. I was dreaming again. I was not doing for others. I was focused on me. The Nora before cancer was disappearing, and I was becoming closer to the one that I was, was meant to be. I began to see cancer as an opportunity. I was not angry, on the contrary, I was um, so grateful that God gave me a second chance. The road was long and difficult. Cancer is not pretty or in colors. The different stages, diagnosis, treatment, recuperation, come with a bundle of decisions to make and challenges. It has taken a few years to feel me and whole again. I'm still on the journey, journey. Lots to do more physically and emotionally. But today is what I have. Today I'm here. Today I'm me. I live planning less, sometimes not at all, and enjoying more, lots more. When I see the scars in my body and soul, I feel the overwhelming gratitude towards God for allowing me to rise above every and single challenge in my life and get closer to his plan. My hope is that we all embrace the wonderful gifts given to us and that we craft our own resurrection story because it is a decision and it is personal. Amen.